The third reason for the speaking of the Sutra is to point to the true mind and manifest the basic nature. The Suragama Sutra points directly to our mind so we may see our nature and realize Buddhahood. What is this mind? It is the true mind which cannot be seen. The heart within your chest that you can see is merely the flesh heart, the only function of which is to keep you alive. It is not your, the true mind. It certainly cannot lead you to genuine understanding. If the heart within your chest were the true mind, it should be able to accompany you when you die. However, the person's body remains after death and the flesh heart is still within it. So the flesh heart is not your true mind. Your true mind is the Buddha nature. Where is the Buddha nature? It is not outside or inside or in the middle. The sutra text will explain this principle in great detail. The sutra will also explain the 10 instances of manifesting the same nature that is one's true mind. This is the third reason the sutra was spoken, to point out the pure nature and bright substance of the eternally dwelling true mind, which neither comes nor goes neither moves nor changes. It is the basic substance without defilement. Its nature is pure, its substance bright. The fourth reason the sutra was spoken is to display the samadhi of the nature and to exhort us to actual certification. There are many dhammadors in the cultivation of samadhi. Externalists also develop samadhis, but in cultivating samadhis, if one is off at the beginning, even by a hair's breadth, one will miss the mark in the end by a thousand miles. Therefore, it is necessary to cultivate proper samadhi and to avoid cultivating Javan samadhi. The samadhis cultivated by externalists are Javan samadhis, not proper samadhis, because their samadhis are not the proper samadhi of the true mind. Of the true nature, they will never achieve a sagehood, no matter how long they cultivate, it is said. When the nature is in samadhi, demons are subdued and every day is blissful. When false thoughts do not arise, everywhere is peaceful. Why do people have demonic obstacles when they cultivate? Why do karmic obstacles arise? It is be it's just because people's natures lack samadhi. If the nature is in samadhi, all demons can be subdued. There are many kinds of demons. This sutra explains 50 kinds of skanda demons. Actually, there are many, many demons. Heavenly demons, earth demons, human demons, god demons, and wheat demons. Heavenly demons are the demon kings in the heavens who come to disturb you, draw dhyana concentration. Earth demons that dwell on the earth, human demons, ghost demons, weird demons, and strange creatures also all come to disturb your dhyana concentration. Why do they do this? Because before you attain Buddhahood, you are a member of the demons family. When you decide to leave the family of demons, cultivate dhyana concentration, and birth and death, and break through the turning wheel, the demons are still fond of you. They love you and can't let you go. Therefore, they come to bother your spirit and disturb your dhyana concentration. If you have no concentration power, you can be turned by the demon's days and end up following them. If you have concentration power, you won't be turned. You will be thus, thus unmoving, clear and eternally bright. To be thus, thus unmoving is to have concentration power. To be clear and eternally bright is to have wisdom power with the combined powers of concentration and wisdom. No demon can move you. But if you have no concentration or wisdom power, you will follow the demons and become their children and grandchildren. It is extremely dangerous. The reason externalists do not develop the concentration of the nature is because they apply effort to the branches, not the root. They work on the false shell of a body. Their mistake is to identify the sixth consciousness, the ordinary mind, with their true mind. 
as a result of their cultivation, they get a little of the experience of still quiescence. But what they experience is not actual. They force themselves to keep their thoughts from arising, but they haven't dug out the root of their polluted thinking, so they can't end birth and death. It is like trying to use the rock to prevent grass from growing. When the rock is removed, the grass grows right back. When cultivators of external religions relax their efforts, it is just like removing the rock. Their methods are not ultimate. In Diana cultivation, one investigates the meditation topic, who is mindful of the Buddha. By investigating this topic, one sweeps away all dramas and leaves all appearances. In seeking for who, one penetrates to the root of all polluted thinking and rips it out. If you use this method, the day will come when your contemplation will suddenly penetrate through and you will suddenly become enlightened. Then you will know whether your nostrils are pointing up or down. At present, you don't know whether your nostrils face up or down. Once you are enlightened, you will know and then you're on your way. When Shakyamuni Buddha spoke the Suragama Sutra, there were in India various religious groups that did not discuss enlightenment. Rather, they imitated the behavior of cows or dogs. This strange practice came about because someone, while sitting in Samadhi, had seen a cow reborn in the heavens, and this person concluded, I should study the behavior of cows. He began to eat grass and live outside in the cow shed and to learn how to even sleep like a cow. When he wasn't sleeping, he cultivated a bit of samadhi, but he had no genuine accomplishment. It was Devin Samadhi. Another religion of that time came about because someone had a confused dream in which a dog was born in the heavens. This person decided that if he imitated the behavior of dogs, he too would be born in the heavens. He modeled himself after a dog in every way, guarding the door, eating things dogs eat, and sleeping the way dogs do. But in the end, such cultivation did not bring ultimate accomplishment. Another old cultivator of another religion cultivated the no-thought samadhi, in which he didn't think of anything. He was about uh, he was without polluted thinking, and finally, in his cultivation, he was born in the no-thought heaven. But birth in the no-thought heaven is not ultimate, and eventually he fell. This too is considered a Devin Samadhi. All these methods taught by externalists are not ultimate, not fundamental. They are not cultivation of the self-nature, our origin. Using the ordinary mind and its false thinking to cultivate the Buddha Dharma is like trying to make rice by cooking sand. It will never succeed. You can cultivate for countless ages, but you won't escape the turning wheel. You won't realize Buddhahood. It is essential for those of you who wish to cultivate to meet a master who has genuine understanding in order for you to be able to attain genuine Samadhi power. In order to attain real Samadhi power, you will certainly have to undergo the tests of demons also. As I mentioned earlier, there are many kinds of demons. There are external demons and internal demons. The external demons are not too difficult to subdue, but the demons produced in our mind, our, your own mind, are hard to defeat. Certain demons that bring sickness are so hard to subdue. When I was about 17 or 18, I studied the Buddha drama and yet was very arrogant. My arrogance prompted me to say an insane thing. Most people are afraid of demons, but I have no fear of them. In fact, demons fear me. Wouldn't you say that was an insane remark? No matter what kind of demons they are, heavenly demons, earth demons, spirit demons, ghost demons, human demons, no matter what kind, I have no fear of them. After I finished sprouting off, what do you suppose happened? I was attacked by a sickness demon, and then it was 
I who feared the demons. Not the demons who feared me because sickness inhibits one's movements like a yoke and chains. My body wouldn't obey my commands. I told it to walk, but it wouldn't. I told it to sit, but it couldn't. From morning to night, I lay on the bed, unable to eat or drink. The demon had me trapped. Then I realized what I had said was all wrong. I had boasted that I wasn't afraid of demons, but now when the sickness demon caught me, I was powerless. I was so sick that I was oblivious to everything. It seemed certain I would die. But just as I was lingering on for one last breath, when I was almost dead, but not quite, another thing happened to me. I saw the three fellow sons born of Manchuria, two monks, one a Taoist master and one a Buddhist bishu and one a layman. The three came and told me to come out and play and I followed them outside. It was very strange. Just outside the door I started, I started to walk but my feet weren't touching the ground. Although I wasn't in an airplane, I was in empty space. It wasn't like mounting the clouds and driving the fog. However, it was like being enveloped in space. I walked on the tops of houses and soon they looked very small and I could see lots of people below. We went to all the famous temples, mountains and great rivers. We went to the four sacred mountains in China, Wu Tai, Five Peaks, Mei Chiu Hua, Nine Flowers and Pu Tua. Everywhere we went there were lots of wherever Wherever we went there were lots of temples and lots of people. We didn't stop in China. We didn't stop with China, however, and soon were flying over foreign lands where the people were fair-haired and blue-eyed. We went from place to place so quickly that it was like watching a movie, where frame after frame flashes on the screen in a constant change of scene, except there was no projector or screen, and I actually went to the places I saw. After seeing and hearing many things, I arrived back at my own front door. I opened the door and looked into my house. There and there on the bed was another me. The moment I realized there were two of me, I became one, and my breath and pulse returned. He hasn't died, exclaimed my father and mother, who were seated beside me. He's alive. Then I realized that when I had seen myself on the bed, unable to move, I had been sick. I asked my mother and father about it, and they said I had been in a coma for seven or eight days and had seemed dead. So I am a living dead man. Even I myself thought I was dead and then I was born anew. After that, I wasn't so insane. I never said that I didn't fear demons or that demons feared me. Take my advice. Whatever you do, don't say things like that. If you say, I'm not afraid of anything, in the future you will encounter something that will frighten you. But to say, I'm afraid of everything is also incorrect in general. Don't even, don't even bring up such illicit useless topics. Prior to my illness, I was an instructor at the Way Virtual Society. I lectured on the advantages of benevolence, righteousness, the way and good conduct. Not only did I just exhort others to do good deeds, I myself also practiced benefiting others. I had cultivated to the point that I felt I had a little skill. One day I read an article about Transcend's exemplary way of life and I decided I wanted to be just like him. I vowed to heaven that I would practice the deeds of Chang Xuan. But after I made the vow, I regretted it. Of what use is imitating him, I wondered doubtfully and strangely enough that very evening a demon came to test me to see if I really could keep my vow. If 
you make vows, the Bodhisattvas may come to touch you. The point is, don't speak arrogantly. Take care to avoid something that pleases you, or in time something will happen to cause you to be displeased. Keep your mind on cultivation of the way. Don't use the mind that ordinary people use, but rather a mind that is intent on the way. Cultivate the samadhi of the nature and seek actual accomplishment. Actual accomplishment is the opposite of what is empty and false. One whose accomplishment is empty and false may suddenly think, I have just realized Buddhahood and while sitting in dhyana, he may feel that his body is like the Buddha's, emitting light and moving the earth. Actually, there isn't anything going on at all. The experience is empty and false. It is not the accomplishment of the way. One may think, sitting here in dhyana, I saw the Buddha give me a prediction, saying, you will soon realize Buddhahood. Don't bother to cultivate. You are a Buddha already. This, too, is a false experience. It is not genuine accomplishment of the way. Shakyamuni Buddha accomplished the way beneath the Bodhi tree. He sat there for 49 days, and then one evening, he saw a star and awakened to the way. Strange indeed, strange indeed, strange indeed, he said. All living beings have the Buddha nature. All can become Buddhas. However, before he had accomplished Buddhahood, a heavenly demon came to test him. It transformed into a beautiful woman who came before the Buddha and spoke seductively, trying to get him to abandon his cultivation and marry her instead. But the Buddha, from within his samadhi, was not moved by the sight of this exquisite creature. He just thought, you think you are really beautiful, but actually you are an old hag. Countless wrinkles line your face, and from your eyes, nose, and nose flow filthy tears and mucus. There is not in your nose and phlegm and saliva in your mouth. Your whole body is filthy, and yet you still come and try to treat me. The Buddha contemplated this thought from within Samadhi and transformed the demon's power so that the demon turned into an old woman. Her hair turned white, her teeth fell out, and her nose began to run with snot. She looked wretched. Look at yourself, the Buddha told the demon. The demon looked and was so ashamed that she ran away. Many such demons came to test the Buddha, but the Buddha was never turned. Since he was not turned by the demons, he accomplished the Buddha way. When people work hard cultivating the way, they are likely at crucial stages of development to undergo the test of demons. Before you have any skill, the demons won't test you, but once you develop a little skill, they will try you out. If you don't recognize it as a test, then you may run off and draw the retinue of demons. If you want to cultivate to the point of actual accomplishment, you must develop the samadhi of the nature. When you cultivate by working on the samadhi of the nature and your nature is not moved, you will naturally have samadhi power and your accomplishment will naturally be true and actual, not false. If you are moved by demons, then your samadhi is not true and proper but is rather a devon samadhi which will not lead you to buddhahood earlier i mentioned the devon samadhis developed by people who studied the behavior of cows and dogs how did the cow and dog they imitated happen to get born in the heavens in a former life the cow had cultivated the ten good deeds but before that it had done many bad things the retribution for the evil deeds caused it to be born as a cow, and the reward for its cultivation of the ten good deeds led it a death to be reborn in the heavens. The same was true for the dog. Not knowing the past causes and conditions of the cow and the dog that led to their rebirth in the heavens, these people thought that it was merely being a cow or a dog in the present life that led to the heavenly reward. 
so they blindly imitated the behavior of cows and dogs. Nothing came of their cultivation, however, and they couldn't obtain actual accomplishment. Actual accomplishment means the genuine realization of one's own perfect, clear, inherent wisdom and samadhi power. Where samadhi is wisdom and wisdom is samadhi in a mutual, perfect, unobstructed interpenetration. It is to realize the true fundamental substance. It is to obtain one's own true mind. Upside down thoughts are improper. People are really upside down. Well, people aren't actually upside down. Their thinking is when Ananda and Mantanji's daughter returned to the Buddha, Ananda bowed and asked for instruction. After hearing it, he spoke a verse which begins, The wonderfully deep Dharani, the unmoving honored one, the foremost Suragama king, is really found in the world. The unmoving honored one is the Suragama Samadhi. The entire sentence refers to Shakyamuni Buddha. It is rare because, as the third line of the verse says, it melts away my inverted thoughts gathered in a million compass. Life after life, for limit this valley's compass, Ananda had been striking up upside down thoughts, thinking of improper things.